new post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. You haven't noticed anything at all unusual, Sheriff? Well, nothing I can think of, Mr. Carter. Not even some little thing that's out of the ordinary? <laughs> well, the only thing I've seen different is that a lot of folks who never wore glasses are wearing them now. Hey, wait a minute, Sheriff. Yeah. You say lots of folks have suddenly taken to wearing glasses? That's right, Mr. Carter. Sheriff, that's the answer I was looking for. New glasses. Come on. Come on where? To catch a murderer. And there's no time to lose. And now, the case of the failing eyes. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This early summer morning, a sleek new car drives into the yard of a small farm in western Pennsylvania. A man and a woman get out briskly, carrying notebooks and sheets of official-looking documents. They approach the tall old farmer who is watching them curiously and explain their business crisply. Good morning, sir. Morning. I hope we're not intruding. Uh, permit us to introduce ourselves. My name's Blake, and this is Mr. Ransom. Good morning. Morning, ma'am. We're research experts for the Federal Foundation, Mr. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Fred Thomas. Oh, Mr. Thomas. You've heard of the Federal Foundation, of course. Oh, can't say I have. Well, the Federal Foundation is engaged in a nationwide survey of public health. Mr. Lake and I are one of 1,500 teams of research scientists covering the entire country. Mm, you don't say. So, if you've got half an hour to spare, we'll get our information as quickly as possible and move on. Ready, Alice? Yes, all set. All right. Physical condition of farm? Excellent. Drainage? Good. That's a chemical disposal plant back there, Mr. Thomas. Yeah. I thought so. Splendid. Electricity? Oh, yes, yes. I see the wiring. Bottle gas for cooking? Excellent. Best conditions for maintenance of health. Got it, Alice? Right. Now, your own condition, Mr. Thomas. Age? Seventy. Any recent operations or illnesses? Nope. Physical condition? <laughs> the best, I should say. I can tell. One moment. What is it? Mind if I take a close look at your eyes, Mr. Thomas? My eyes? Hmm. Yes, I see. You're having difficulty reading lately, huh, Mr. Thomas? Well, as a matter of fact, I do. Print is blurred, your eyes seem dim, tendency to squint, headache sometimes, huh? Uh, yes. Oh, it's too bad. I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas. Alice? Yes? Put down condition of eyes, bad. First stages of cataract. First stages of what? Cataract. Yes. You mean Mr. Thomas is going blind? Yes, I'm sorry. Cataract, unmistakable <laughs> symptom. <laughs> oh, it's no laughing matter, Mr. Thomas. If you value your eyes you back, know, you... know, son, you almost had me fool for a minute. It's the same old racket, but with new trimmings. Mr. Thomas, what Why, do you mean? you cheap little crook. You think you were handing out this line to a rube? I was a detective for 30 years before I retired to this little place. Detective? Jerry, let's get out of here. No, you right. don't. Let's see your rockets ended right now. We ain't got an eye doctor in a hundred miles, but we got a fine little jail down in town. Let go, you hear? Let's go. The old cataract racket, eh? Well, it's finished, Mr. I told you. No, to Jerry, let... no, no, don't. <laughs> What's the letter say, Pastor? It says, My dear Mr. Carter, in accordance with your wishes, I am keeping you in touch with news about your old friend, Fred Thomas. I'm very sorry to tell you that Fred is dead. Dead? Go on, Pastor. He committed suicide on his farm sometime yesterday. Suicide? A note was found in which Fred stated that he had been depressed for some time owing to failure of his health, and that he had decided to give up the struggle. Well, that's impossible. I can't tell you how sorry I am to give you this news. Yours very sincerely, Walter Bleak of Attorney. I can't believe it, Patsy. <laughs> Fred Thomas was pretty close to 70, Nick. Fred could be 170. He'd never commit suicide. Well, some people, when their health fails, Patsy, they... Fred Thomas worked with my father. He was my father's friend and mine. Fred never gave up a fight. Never. Well, what do you think happened, Nick? I'm not going to do anything until we've got facts to go on. Do you want me to write to the lawyer, Bleak? No, get your bag packed. We're driving out to Westville at once. <laughs> Come in. Sheriff. Sure. 
Sheriff Parsh. In the flesh, mister. I'd like to talk to you. My name's Nick Carter. This is my secretary, Patsy Bowen. Hello. The detective fellow, eh? Well, what do you want to talk about? Fred Thomas. Nothing to talk about. Case is closed. Well, Sheriff, I'm not exactly satisfied with the facts as they stand. You're not, eh? No, I'm not. Well, ain't that too bad? Look, Mr. Nick Carter, we've got a small police department here. Not exactly fancy like your big city outfits, but we know our way around. I'm sure you do. Oh, so if you've got any idea of making a big show down here... Excuse me, Sheriff. I don't like to interrupt, but you don't understand. I've come down here to cooperate and help. If there are any headlines, you can have them. Ah. Look, Sheriff, Patsy and I just checked in at the Westville Hotel. Would you mind calling the desk clerk? Why should I do that? To prove that I'm sincere. Call him and ask him to read you the names of the people who just checked in. If that doesn't satisfy you, we'll get out of town. Well, I think you're crazy. But uh, just to get rid of you, I'll do it. Ellie, get me Sam Woods at the hotel. Yeah. <clears throat> Sam? Now, this is Joe Parsh. I understand a man and a woman just checked in. What's their names? Mr. Nelson Crane and Miss Paula Brown. Shoe salesman? Well, well, well. Thanks, Sam. Well, Sheriff? I, uh, I guess maybe I made a mistake, Mr. Carter. I, uh, I apologize to you and Miss Bone. Forget it, Sheriff. All I want to do is to find out what happened to my old friend. Fred Thomas. Oh, come on, come on. We'll, we'll go out to Fred's farm right now. And by heaven, if you earn any headlines, I'll split them with you. This is where he was found, Mr. Carter, the day before yesterday. This the parlor, huh? Right. Old Mrs. Jameson found his body. She used to clean up for him every few days. Oh, then Fred lived alone? All alone, Miss Vaughan. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the note we found on the table. Fred was slumped in the chair right in front of me. Mm -hmm. My health is going fast. I'm 70 years old. Doesn't seem worth fighting anymore. Sheriff, this doesn't smell right. No? This note is printed. Why wasn't it written? Well, that bothered me, too. But then I remembered. Fred's eyes have been going back on him. Maybe. But how about the suicide? He shoot himself? Yeah. To the heart. You checked the gun for prints? Yeah. The gun's down at the courthouse. But I've got photos with me. Yeah, I'll show them to you. Hmm. It was a 38 automatic. The bullet checked with the gun, all right. Then he dusted the prints inside and out. Found Fred's prints all over. Sharp and clear as a crystal. Every one of them. You think? I think the sheriff's right, Nick. Fred must have committed suicide. No, Pepper. Huh? Now, these photographs prove I'm right. The fingerprints on that gun were placed there after Fred was killed. But... They were what? It's a simple matter, Sheriff. You know that. All the killer had to do was take the dead man's hand, wrap it around well, the gun, and... of course, and... Nick, but what makes you so sure that's what happened? Because the prints are too clear and sharp, Patsy. Especially when Fred's supposed to have held the gun when he shot himself. Too clear? Yes, the recoil of the gun in his dying hand would have smudged the prints. They couldn't possibly be sharp. By heaven, you're right. I've been a fool. The question now is, who killed Fred Thomas and why? That's right. Let's go back to your office, Sheriff, and start thinking. <laughs> Sheriff, you say Fred had no enemies at all in Westville? Not one. He was a fine man, and everyone liked him. And you also say he had nothing worth stealing. No, nothing worth stealing. Uh -huh. Then it gets down to this. Fred must have come across something new, something bad here in Westville. Whatever that was, he was killed as a result. We've got to find what it was. Well, uh, you name it, Mr. Carter, and we'll find it. So, Sheriff, you're the man to call the turn now. I am. Oh. Well, have you noticed anything new or different or unusual about Westville recently? Suspicious strangers passing through, new businesses, anything? Well, I can't think of nothing. <clears throat> At least nothing suspicious. Not even some little thing that's out of the ordinary? <laughs> well, the only thing I've noticed recently is that lots of folks who never wore glasses are wearing them now. Hey, wait a minute, Sheriff. Wait. There are lots of folks that suddenly taken to wearing glasses who never wore them before. That's right. Well, even old Jim Small's got a pair. Why do you mention Jim Small particularly? Well, because he'd be the last fella I'd expect to see wearing glasses. Why, he... Wait a minute. I wonder where Jim got them specs he's wearing. Well, he probably bought them at the Oculus, same as anyone else. Uh, that's just the point, Miss Bourne. There ain't no Oculus in Westville. 
Well, when anyone wants glasses, they drive the 16 miles over to Garytown. The gems been laid up for the last few months with a lame back. Well, he couldn't get to Garytown. Maybe he bought them by mail. Not Jim Small. He'd want to see what he's buying first. Sheriff, I think you've given me the answer I was looking for. New glasses. I don't get it. Let's go ask Jim Small about it. There's just one chance in a hundred that this is the something new that killed Fred Thomas. <laughs> Physical condition of farm, excellent. Best conditions for maintenance of health. Got it, Alice? Right. Now, about your own condition, Mr. Olson. Age? Oh, I was 65. Mm hmm. Recent operations or illnesses? Well, 10 years ago, I get appendix taken out. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing <laughs> serious in that. <laughs> now, your physical condition. Well, the best, I should say. I should. One moment. What is it, Jerry? Do you mind if I take a close look at your eyes, Mr. Olson? My eyes? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, I see. You're having difficulty reading lately, huh? Prints blurred, your eyes seem dim, tendency to squint, headache sometimes, huh? Yeah, yeah, that is right. Ah, oh, too bad. I'm sorry, Mr. Olson, I've got bad news for you. Bad news? Take this, Alice. Mm -hmm. Condition of eyes, dangerous. First stages of cataract. What? Cataract. Yes. Sure. You mean I go blind? I'm sorry, but it looks as if oh, you... No, no, not blind. I, I cannot go blind. Better I kill myself. Oh, I... it's not as bad as all I... that, Mr. Olson. Mister, you and, and lady, you scientific people from Federal Phone... From... The Federal Foundation. You know science. You know about eyes. Maybe, maybe you tell me how it affects you, please. Well, there is a cure, Mr. Olson. Oh, you yeah, tell me. The Federal Foundation Elixir, Alice, get a bottle. Right, sir. Now, this treatment, when taken with a special foundation glasses, retards the progress of cataracts. Oh, you yeah. this is good. Uh, unfortunately, it's a difficult formula to prepare, Mr. Olson. It's rather expensive. How much? Uh, $100. $100? If the price is too much for you, Mr. Oh, no, Olson. No, no. No price too much to pay for eyes. I pay. You wait here. I got money from home. I get a pair of the foundation glasses, too, Alice. In southwest, 24 miles an hour. Barometer, 29.91 and calling. Hearn, it's right. Please radio on again. Huh? Tell her next time she leaves that phone. You, XQ, I... brings you a special warning. Huh? Sheriff Park, Sheriff in association Park. with Nick Carter, Warns all citizens to be on the lookout for two crooks now working the cataract racket in this county. That's all right. A man and a woman claiming to be representatives of the federal foundation are working through the farms and selling bogus cures for imaginary cases of cataracts. Imaginary. Any information as to their whereabouts should be phoned directly to this station. A reward of one thousand dollars will be paid. By Jiminy, I get them and I get the reward too. Hello, Mrs. Short. I want to call radio station right away. Oh, I hear an announcement. I think I've been rewarded. You get radio station pick, please. I think Crook is here on my farm now. Oh, money. It's right. Take one hundred dollars from me. Now I take one thousand dollars from them. I tell Nick Carter all about <laughs> this. Good work, Jerry. Yeah, he's out cold. Hang up that receiver, quick. Okay. We're in a jam, but there's one ray of sunshine. At least this big mouth didn't get through to Nick Carter. The two crooks stand over Olsen's body, and Nick is 70 miles away. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. Now back to The Case of the Failing Eyes. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. Heavy thunderclouds are slowly covering the sky as Nick's long black convertible scorches down the roads, eating up the miles to Olson's farm. How much further, Sheriff? Uh, just a few more minutes, Miss Bart. Uh -huh. You know, Nick, I keep thinking about that phone call to the radio station. People kind of make fun of the way local phone operators in the country gossip and listen in to local conversations. Yeah. But if that Mrs. Choke, you know, the local operator, hadn't been in the habit of listening in on what people were saying, she wouldn't have been able to relay Mr. Olson's message to us. Well, I'm still worried about Olson. Yeah. Right, what do you think happened to him? I'm afraid the crooks overheard his call and shut him up. Uh, ease up, Mr. Carter. Here's Olson's place. 
golly. Thank heaven that's over. 70 miles in 73 minutes. That's traveling. Oh, it sure is. Come on. This is uh, Ed Larry here, local police officer. Hi, Ed. Hi, Joe. Finally gone here, didn't you? Yeah, uh, this is Nick Carter and Miss Patsy Bourne. Ed Larry. How do you do? How's Olson, Mr. Larrow? We don't know, Mr. Carter. Now, what do you mean? Seems like he ain't around nowhere, Miss Carter. Seems like he's disappeared. Well, Nick, we've uh, checked the house, the barn, shed, and the chicken coops, all the buildings on the farm. And he ain't in any of them, Mr. Carter. But he must be here somewhere. I'll tell you what, Mr. Lara. Suppose you have your men check the rest of the farm. Search all the ditches, gullies, the brook back of the orchard, and so on. Okay, we'll do that. Let's go, man. Oh, if Olsen was murdered, and there's a strong chance he was, the killer may have buried his body. So be on the lookout for fresh-turned earth. We'll keep our eyes open, Mr. Carter. All right, Sheriff. Will you come out to the driveway that turns off the road? Why, what's on your mind? Tire tread. Oh? Rained last night, just enough to make all the tire marks made today plainly visible. Now, look well, here. Uh, quite a mess of tracks in this drive. Oh, Mr. Carter, you think you can make anything out of them? Yeah, maybe. Let's see. This diamond pattern tread belongs to Ed Laro's car. This India balloon is from Olsen's truck. Well, how do you know that, Nick? I checked him while the sheriff and his men were looking for Olsen. What? Oh, so that's why you didn't go with them. Yeah. Now, these are the marks of my tires. These triangular treads are from the other officer's car. Also, the ones of the straight-boarded van. Yes, those are from Tom Adams' car. And that accounts for all our cars. Right. Now, look here, Sheriff. Here's one tire track unaccounted for. Hmm. It's a half-moon pattern. Funny looking, too. And an easy pattern to identify. Sheriff, let's have another look at those pictures you took at the time of Fred Thomas's murder. Yeah, I got them right here, Nick. You want them all? Yeah, I remember one in particular, a close-up of the drive. Yeah, here it is. It's a picture from tire marks. How'd you happen to take that one, Sheriff? Well, I'll tell you. I've been uh, reading a book on detecting, and uh, it said to never overlook a thing. Uh-huh. So when I saw these marks and knew that it wasn't Fred's car, I took the picture just in case something might come up later. And it has, Sheriff. Look closely at this shot. Yeah, that's the same tread. Yeah. Well, Kevin, that same half-moon pattern. And since that tread appears in both places where we know the cataract crooks have been, it's ten to one that it's a tread of their car. I'll buy that. <clears throat> now what do we do? Well, this is mostly a backcountry district. Practically all the roads are dirt. Maybe we can follow this tire, Mark, and catch up with those crooks. Maybe. If the rain holds off. Yeah. Got to work faster when it beats the rain. Let's see. The tire marks here from the right are overlapped by those going out to the left. That means the ones to the left are more recent. Mm -hmm. And then the killers drove out and turned south on the road. Right. So let's get in my car and follow the track. You really think you've got a chance, Nick? Yes, Patsy, if they stick to the dirt roads. And if the rain holds off... Straight ahead, Mr. Carter. Straight ahead. I can still make out the half-moon pattern. Certainly been weaving in and out of the back road. Probably Ed Larry should take credit for that. How so? Uh, he set up roadblocks in a ten-mile circle right after I spoke to him on the phone. Good man. That means our friends are running in circles trying to find a place to break through. Bless, Nick, bless. Oh, yeah, yeah, thanks, Betsy. Oh, doggone it. Huh? What's the matter, Sheriff? The, the rain started. Oh, sure what has. If we don't overtake them before the next fork or crossroad, I'm afraid they'll get away. Unless the roadblock stop them. It's caught it. Look up there ahead. Why, there's smoke. Yeah, black smoke. What does that remind you of, Sheriff? Why, uh, burning oil or gasoline. Well, them crooks couldn't have cracked up running away, could they? We'll see in a moment. Hold on. Right. Well, it's a car, all right. Down in the culvert. Come on. Uh-huh. Oh, good grief. Look at it. Pretty well burned out. Must have crashed at least an hour ago. Yeah. Watch your step, Patsy. I'm all right. Hey, look. Two bodies inside. Badly burned. Oh, looks like a man and a woman. Oh. Two door sedans, church light on the roof, fog lights over bumper, last two numbers on license plate, five nine. That all checks with what Jen Small told us, Nick. Yeah, to kill his car without any questions. Uh, he went in, smashed in. Yeah, looks like death caught him before we did. Hey, give me a hand with this door, will you, sir? All right, force it open. <coughs> Oh, a man and a woman. 
about all they can say now. I have to check further for identification. It looks like the remains of books and bottles here in the back seat. And what's left of a lot of spectacles, too. Well, I guess nobody will ever drive in this car again. We don't know that anybody will want to drive it. Them two crooks don't need a car no more. Not that they're both dead. I wonder whether they are. What? Nick, what on earth do you mean? Patsy, I've got a job for you. This case isn't finished yet. What? Are you crazy, Mr. Carnes? Don't death finish a case? Depends on who's dead, Sheriff. Now, listen, both of you. Here's what I want to do. Somewhere, not very far away. Sorry, it's getting so dark and getting all mixed up. I wish I could cover all these back roads, but I don't know where I've been and where I haven't. These John roads twist and turn like a, like a labyrinth. I wish Nick were here. I'd like to ask him whether... Hey! Hey! Mm-hmm. Oh, Get off the road. You want to get knocked down? But let's go to the door. Move out, sister. What? what in the world? It's a gun, sister. Get out of the car. You. I've been waiting two hours for an easy mark to come along, and you're it. The car belongs to me now, lady. You won't be needing it anymore. Patsy stares at the wild-eyed man who fingers his revolver nervously and motions her out of Nick's car. We'll see what she does in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Failing Eyes. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old dust cleanser. On a lonely country road, Patsy crouches behind the wheel of Nick's convertible. The armed man who has stopped the car shifts his gun to his left hand, reaches through the open door, and grabs Patsy. Come on, you heard me. Get out. No. I'd just as soon let you have it now, sister. You're You're only a cataract man, aren't you? How do you know? From the description. That tears it, lady. If you ever had a chance, it's gone now. Come on. Oh, Nick. He can't help you now. Come on, let's get off the road. I don't want them to find you right away. Just a couple of hours and your car is all I need. Nick, where are you? Don't be a fool, sister. Yelling won't help none. Yeah, it's far enough. I'm not going to waste time, sister. This is it. Don't have to go. Put that. Oh, Nick, Nick, oh, go looking for that gun, friend. It's probably buried in poison ivy. You hurt your Patsy? No, 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 no. It's just my heart. It won't start again. Well, I'm sorry. I got all tangled up trying to get out of that luggage mm-hmm. compartment. Well, my friend, the racket's finished, and you're... You uh-uh. dirty... No name, please. After all, I could call you a three-time killer, swindler, thief, and all-around crook, but I won't. I'll just call you a jailbird. <laughs> Feeling better now, Patsy? Oh, I guess so, but golly, I was scared stiff, Nick. What? Even though we planned everything in advance? Now, I know, but Nick, how did Jerry Lake get away with that cataract racket? How did he manage to scare people into falling for it? Well, they only picked on the older folks, people who were suffering from the natural short-sightedness of old age. All he did was describe the symptoms of failing eyesight. And they thought he was describing the symptoms of cataract. That's about it. <laughs> what a dirty racket. Yeah. Oh, uh, another thing, Nick. Yeah? You say it was Olsen's body that was burned in Jerry Lake's car. That's right. You see, Jerry murdered the girl he worked with and left her body and Olsen's body in the car when he burned it. Yeah? He figured by making us think he was the one who was who died in the phony wreck so that he could get clear. Well, you said you knew it was a phony accident because the car was still in low gear. Well, I certainly did. If the wreck had been on the level and they'd gone off the road while they were driving along, the car would have been in high gear. <laughs> I didn't notice what gear it was in. I just saw the dead bodies, and that was that. Well, that's what most people think. They look, but they don't see. Just like Jerry Lake. What about Jerry? He couldn't see that when he put Fred's fingerprints on the gun, he was really putting the finger on himself. As a result, he's going to get well acquainted with the electric chair, which is as it should be. Well, Nick, what about the adventure that new post-war old Dutch cleanser will bring us next week? It's a story about women's fashions, Mike. Women's fashions? Well, they've always been a mystery to me. Don't tell me that... Well, in this case, they're more than a mystery. They're a cause for plenty of violence. You see, the fashions were being stolen, and Mary Danville said she knew who was stealing them. And when we went to see her, she walked out of her apartment without saying a word. And a moment later, we found her murdered in her bedroom in that same apartment. Hey, wait. This is confusing enough without going any further. What do you call this adventure, Nick? I call it The Case of the Quiet Roommate. 
Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Alfred Bester. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count... Use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.